Coming up on This Week in Enterprise Tech, the Wi-Fi police go for gold, we check out RF Black Magic, Curiosity logs in, and we hunt for the Wi-Fi glitch. Quiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the following show is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, recorded August 6, 2012, Episode 4. Keep your RF off my yard. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix. It takes just a webcam and a click to turn your online meeting into a high-definition video conference. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use promo code ENTERPRISE. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And I'm joined by a fantastic panel today, starting on my right with Saul Espino from Avago Technologies. Saul, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what Avago is and what they do? Yeah, uh, well, I am an applications, RF applications engineer at Avago Technology. So, Avago designs, uh, manufactures, and tests uh, RF wireless semiconductor devices for handsets, tablets, uh, access points, uh, GPS navigation uh, devices. And recently, we started getting into some small cell uh, base stations. Uh, those are probably more interesting for the enterprise crowd. Um, but our core products are amplifiers, filters, uh, switches, diodes, any kind of RF electronic devices. Now, I know a lot of the products you can't actually tell us about because you're under NDA and people would come after you with swords. But you are here to talk about RF Black Magic, which is fantastic. We'll get to that later, but first I want to introduce the rest of our panel with, of course, Mr. Brian Chi from the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory. Brian, how are things in beautiful, sunny Honolulu? It's actually not sunny today. It's a light drizzle. But uh, I wouldn't notice because I'm a little tired. I've stayed up late watching Mar the Mars landing of Curiosity. Go NASA! <laughs> Go NASA indeed. Speaking of NASA, a, a neighbor of the Launch Center, Curtis Franklin from Enterprise Efficiency, how are you today? Doing quite well, Padre. Thank you very much. It is uh, also not a sunny day here in Florida. We're getting our normal rainy season afternoons, but uh, for those of us who need to catch up on naps after trying to stay awake long enough to see uh, all of the excitement as it happened last night, it's uh, a good thing to have a rainy afternoon. Well, welcome to you all. Thank you for coming on the show. It's going to be a great panel. Now, before we get into the show, I do want to take just a second to uh, congratulate NASA and the JPL on a fantastic, incredibly riveting landing of the Curiosity rover. I, I don't want to go into it too much because uh, TNT and uh, TWIT specials did a fantastic piece on the landing itself. But uh, open question to any of the panelists. Immediate uh, impressions. What do you think about the landing? I I think it's going to open up the world. Um that up until this landing, I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to see man on Mars before I died. But now my faith is restored in NASA, and you know I'm I'd be willing to spend a little few of my tax dollars on that effort. Curtis, I think this is very exciting, not only for what it does for the space program, and Brian is is absolutely right. I think this was a critical step forward in our Mars exploration, but I think this also could help get a lot of the young people interested in those STEM areas. Uh, you know, when you're younger, you need something big to look forward to, something big to look up for, uh, to. And uh, right now, this is about the biggest thing going in terms of interplanetary exploration. Now, this is not all just geeking out. I mean, there is an enterprise angle to this, and that is, well, I mean, how do we communicate with the rover? We have an 8K, that's right, 8 K link to the rover uh, via, well, wireless technology. Saul, tell us a little bit about how you would do that. How do you go over such great distances 
transmitting at even 8K? Well, you just have to get a, a good modulation standard that that will last. It's probably very low data rate, like you said, so maybe some kind of BPSK modulation. So it's, if you get the modulation right, you can transmit, obviously, many, many, many thousands of miles. All right. Now, I don't want to spend too much time. I want to go straight into our enterprise bite. And uh, that is about the Olympic Wi-Fi police. Now, <laughs> I don't know how many of you have uh, read this story, but evidently there's a, a group of Romy, roving geeks who are wandering through the Olympic venues looking for people who uh, have uh, MiFi's and uh, hotspots on their phones, and they're asking them to shut it off. Now, of course, the hacker inside of me, the, the immediate reaction is, no way. It's my Wi-Fi. It's my MiFi. It's my hotspot. I'll use it if I want. But from the administrative point of view, this makes sense. I mean, you can't have everyone turning on their own personal hotspot. It would absolutely obliterate the available spectrum. Cheber, you, you run into this at a university setting, right? I mean, you've got students who walk in with hotspots on their phones. What happens if they turn them all on at the same time? Oh, well, you know, especially the 2.4 gigahertz range, you know, when you get a, an awful lot of APs in a single area, nobody gets good Wi-Fi signal. Um, the unfortunate fact of life is most universities aren't real aggressive about managing their RF envelope. And uh, so things like a, uh, a wireless IPS tends to be an afterthought. And, uh, you know, it's something that needs to be done and something that needs to be looked at, especially if you want 2.4 gigahertz to work. Yeah. Curtis, you've been on the conference circuit quite a bit. And you are no stranger to the phenomenon of people turning on their MiFi's and blotting out Wi-Fi and then complaining about it. I mean, is there something that would go over in the United States? I, I remember back to Google I.O. just a few weeks ago when they were asking really nicely for people to turn off their personal Wi-Fi devices and just no one was listening. Right. And here in the U.S., asking people politely is really about all they can do. I mean, our FCC has some very stringent laws in place that prevent people from going out and intentionally interfering with any sort of radio transmission. So the key here is good citizenship, uh, whether that is being kind enough to turn it off in order to let the official things happen or just being sensible about when you're using it. The problem, of course, is always those people who don't want to be good, either corporate or Olympic citizens. And uh, I'm afraid peer pressure and unfortunately a little bit of uh, surreptitious hacking uh, are the only real answers to things like that. Uh, Saul, I want to throw it to you because one of the, uh, well, the, the phenomenons that I've seen is when you have a high density area, area especially in 2.4 gigahertz, people tend to get frustrated with the uh, the official access points, and so that's when they break out their MiFi's and their mm -hmm. hotspots. But of course, the reason why the official APs aren't working is because there's already too much RF energy in the air. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that works. I mean, w when my wireless device isn't working, what does it do if I then turn on my MiFi? Well, you're, if you keep adding devices, uh, at some point, every network has a signal-to-noise ratio that it actually needs uh, to work. So the, the Wi-Fi network, if, if you exceed the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, then all the users get dumped. So it's, it's not like that last user gets dumped. It's they all get dumped. So even in cellular, if there's too many cellular users, everybody gets dumped. So I think what happened is there was too many users and the signal-to-noise ratio got exceeded. So then nobody got to hear. So yeah. And it's an unlicensed band. So yeah, the FCC will regulate it, but at the end of the day, it's all additive. And if everyone is within spec, but there's too many of them, you're still uh, saturating the network and, it's, and nobody will get uh, service. Right. And, and that's one of the things that people forget, which is the spectrum, the range that we have, especially in 2.4, is very limited and it's shared by everybody. And so occasionally we will come into situations where we have a rogue device or we have a rogue AP or we just have a bunch of interference and we need to find out where it's coming from. Uh, which is where our next segment comes into play. We actually got a chance to play with this. This is a Y-Spy DBX. And actually, we have one of the representatives from the company in the uh, chat room. Uh, uh, I, I may, believe it's Metageek Trent from Metageek. They sent us this device because we've been using technology like this to run down rogue APs and, and rogue 2.4 gigahertz devices. 
I want to show you a little video of, uh, well, what we did to track down a rogue device at Interop. I'm here at the MetaGeek booth with Trent Cutler, and uh, he's going to help us track down a little phenomenon. Uh, Trent, exactly what are we looking at right now? Well, right now, um, we've got an odd spike in the spectrum uh, near Wi-Fi channel 11. And we are curious what it was, so we're going to use the new uh, feature that we've implemented that tracks down devices. So we call it Device Finder. And that's, that's in cooperation with your directional attack? Correct. So as you, as you move it around, it's like a flashlight, so you can find the source of interference. So ground rules are this laptop, that Wi-Spy, this antenna, we're going to find something on the show floor that seems to be buzzing the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So we notice a, an odd peak of interference in the spectrum. And so what we need to do is we need to zoom in just to that source so we can go into device finder mode with the directional antenna and track it down. So we're looking at this amplitude level right here. So we're going to walk around and find it. So I saw an increase of activity, so I'm going to head this way. This view is also showing me um, increase of amplitude right here, so I can also watch this to see if I'm aiming the, the right way or not. So if I aim away from the source, you can see it changes colors according to the signal strength. We're getting closer. As you can see, we've, we've gotten closer to the source. So we're gonna go further this way. So I'm facing the opposite way. And we've had a decrease. So I'm gonna turn around. You notice these red spikes in the spectral view and the increase of activity in the device finder mode. I'm very, very close. We found the source of interference for Wi-Fi channel 11 at Interop with MetaGeek's Channelizer Pro and Device Finder. I apologize to our audio listeners, but let me describe really quickly what we just saw. Essentially, we had an unknown RF source in the conference hall that was destroying Channel 11 in Wi-Fi. So we used MetaGeek's GBX and Channelizer Pro with a directional antenna to do direction finding. And essentially, we walked through the conference hall with, uh, with Trent until we found the source. And it was a robot at the NetOptics booth that had a remote control on the 2.4 gigahertz range. Now, there are some people in the, in the chat room I know who would say, well, I can do that with my laptop right now. Why, why would I need a tool like this? Well, your laptop would only work if it was an AP or another wireless device. This was a, a, a remote control operating in the 2.4 gigahertz, but which did not conform to the Wi-Fi spec. So your laptop wouldn't be able to pick it up. Now, Chibert, I know you've been playing with, uh, with your own Wi-Fi. By... Tell me, in your experience, where would you use a tool like this? Well, any, any anywhere, you know, anywhere that you actually want to have Wi-Fi work, you're going to need to go and find out what you're working against. So when I was actually working on uh, setting up the APEC conference here in Honolulu, one of the things we did was walk around with a Wi-Fi DBX and go and find out what we're up against. And what we found out was there are lots and lots of apartment buildings all around the Honolulu Convention Center, and everybody has an AP. Uh, what that gave us was 
an ability to go and okay, so we're, we're these channels are useless. Let's go and move our stuff to these channels, and maybe we need to shape our RF a little bit more so that we have a chance of actually sliding in a wordage word in edgewise, so to speak. Uh, one of the things I, I do want to show off is this is the channelizer interface that uh, MetaGeek has created for the DBX. Now, you're seeing right now the 2.4 gigahertz range. This is everything in channel 1 through 14, which we don't get. We actually don't get 12, 13, and 14. But you can see all the activity going on in that, that spectrum. Now, this is not good. This explains why the Twit Brick House has such bad Wi-Fi, because we've got all these devices that are not... Well, they're not Wi-Fi devices. And you can see, if, if you bring up the signatures, you can start to match some of these patterns to, to some of the spikes that we're getting on the screen. And uh, it, it's just a very useful tool for us to figure out what's broadcasting, what can we get rid of, uh, and uh, what's destroying our, our Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, you're an RF engineer, Saul. What do you think about this? Uh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, I was telling you earlier that I have four spectrum analyzers from... Agilent Technologies, and they cost me about 100, 107 a piece. One hundred and seven dollars. Uh, that's not, something that's very, not bad. It's, yeah, there's something very similar to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually the other thing. Uh, I remember seeing a spectrum analyzers and oscilloscopes when I was a kid, and always wanting one of them, but they were crazy expensive. Uh, you know, hundred thousand, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I can get a, a DBX for two hundred, and I can get the channelizer software for another four to six hundred. So this essentially gives me the power of a, a full-blown spectrum analyzer on my laptop. Uh, Curtis, w where do you see devices like this being, uh, well, popular? Well, I think that Brian was very good about naming some of the places he's used it. And a lot of enterprises are going to be doing the same thing. I find it fascinating when I'm driving around on interstates to see, even on the interstate, how very many Wi-Fi hotspots will pop in and out of your iPad, your laptop computer's knowledge range as you're going up and down. Um, horse farms, for example. I don't think there is a barn in horse country that doesn't have at least one Wi-Fi hotspot. Well, if you're an enterprise computer IT specialist who's trying to set up branch offices, you have to deal with apartment buildings, with other offices and with things like the rogue microwave oven. Uh, I've no, talked to several people who found that at lunchtime or at break time, suddenly the Wi-Fi network would go away, tracked it down, and sure enough, there was a microwave oven with a leaky gasket around the door. And every time someone popped a bag of popcorn, it blitzed the Wi-Fi for the entire office. So there are a lot of occasions when something like this is going to be absolutely vital if you want to, if not fix things, at least explain to users why they're having problems. Now, one thing I, I do want to point out, yes, there are signatures down here for everything from X10 devices to Bluetooth transmitters to video transmitters on uh, HDMI platforms. So it, it does give you a really nice breath of uh, well what's out there something else i do want to uh, point out before we move on is if i switch this over to the five gigahertz range now take a look at the 2.4 in the five gigahertz that's what it looks like this is why we're always telling users to move their devices over to five gigahertz look how flat that is look how clean it is you've got so much more space to play if you use five gigahertz devices rather than 2.4 uh Chibert, how successful successful are you in moving over to five? Uh, I actually don't run anything other than five gigahertz now. The only things that are on uh, 2.4 are obviously phones and a few other devices. Um, I actually had a problem with my cousin's home where we had this one gentleman that refused. You know, I even offered to help him reconfigure his AP so he would quit trashing the uh, surrounding channels. But he actually threatened to have me arrested for um, trespassing. So the only way I could get around that was actually to move my cousin to 5 gigahertz. Now, Chibert, to be fair, if you came on my property, I'd probably have you arrested too. So, Oh, gee, thanks. Just, just so you know. Now, uh, we will be taking a much closer look at the Y-Spy DBX. This is actually one of the pieces of gear that we will show off in our, our Pro Gear segment. So, so don't worry, we're going to bring it back. But uh, right now, all we wanted to show was that it is a very useful tool when you're trying to build a way to communicate. And Chibert, you know what else is a really good tool to communicate? 
Okay, I'll bite. What's another real good tool to communicate? Go to meeting with HD Faces by Citrix. That's right. It's one of our sponsors. They've been a sponsor of Twit forever. And there's a reason for that. It's because they're good at what they do. Now, I am a traveler. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are travelers like me. And I spend so much of my time on the road, in planes, living in airports, in hotels. But as much as I would like to not do that, you can't get around the fact that sometimes you want to see the person across the table. You want to see their face. You want to see how they react. You want to see how they're actually feeling when you pitch them ideas and what they look like when they're speaking to you. That's where HD Faces comes into play. GoToMeeting is already the best conferencing meeting software and service out on the market. It's easy. I can share my documents. I can share my screen. But beyond that, it's easy to set up a meeting. I don't really need to be a computer expert if I know how to use Outlook, if I know how to use a calendar, if I know how to send an email. I can set up a GoToMeeting meeting. Not only that, it works on my iPad. It works on my mobile device, which means I can use it on the go. So if I'm in between meetings, if I'm sitting at an airport, if I'm sitting in a hotel and I don't have my setup, I can always pull out my tablet and be ready to go. What we'd like for you to do is we'd like you to go to GoToMeeting. We'd like you to go to the website and check out GoToMeeting with HD Faces. My listeners can try it free for 30 days. Now, for this special offer, just go to GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use the promo code ENTERPRISE. Remember to use the promo code ENTERPRISE so that uh, they know that Twyet sent you. We thank Citrix for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now let's get to the main event. Saul, you're here not just because you're my brother-in-law, but because you are one of the best RF engineers the Bay Area knows. And you're going to tell us a little bit about, uh, well, RF Black Magic. First of all, what is RF? RF stands for radio frequency. So anything in the electromagnetic spectrum that you know, can radiate stands for RF, basically. Okay, so all my wireless devices from my laptop to my cell phone to, uh, heck, the, the uh, remote control I have connected to my Google TV box, that's all RF. Yes. Okay. Now, what would you say are two things that everyone needs to know about RF and RF design? Uh, a couple of the challenges uh, um, designing RF, the, well, the obvious ones, I'll start with the obvious ones first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of lesser known ones. Uh, the obvious ones are that there's more and more bands coming online. As you know, there's a lot of uh, rebanded LTE bands from, taken away from the old uh, digital TV or the analog TV stuff. So a lot of new bands, a lot of new LTE bands, even the existing bands uh, for PCS and cell have been expanded. Uh, they're, they're, there's like 5 megahertz on this side and 10 megahertz on that side. So there's more and more frequencies coming online. That means that specs are going to get tougher uh, and the pricing is always going to get cheaper. So uh, our phone guys always want, you know, tougher specs, cheaper price. But the, the two main ones that I want to get, uh, that I want to tell you about are, um, it's more trial and error than most people want to admit or than people in our industry want to admit. Uh, because this implies that, that maybe our modelings, our models are not as good as they should be. Uh, we could make better models, but, uh, but that would take too much time. It, modeling all this would take probably weeks to... Let me ask you about that. I mean, because that's, that's one of the, the things that always struck me as funny. We think we know everything about RF. I mean, we've got it in the lab. We, we can run it through a spectrum analyzer. We know how it bounces off of certain services and not. You're telling me that, well, it, it's still kind of a, more of an art than a science? It is. It's definitely an art. We, we can model one device. Like, we sell, like, amplifiers. We can model that amplifier to death. But then once the customer takes that and uses it in his device, he might put a shield on top of it. He might put other devices around it. So then we, it's, it'd be, it's too hard to model every possible combination of you know, interactions. Um, I had an example, as I said, of, of the shielding. Uh, when you take RF and you put a shield, which, which in the industry is pretty common uh, because of the FCC, you're, re you're, you're limited to how much energy you can spit out right. uh, in, other, in other bands. So it, most, most access points, hand, tablets, anything that has an RF will have a shield over the, what we call the front end module, which is the RF section. So once you put a shield on top of something, especially the RF devices, you basically, you, you prevent any kind of electromagnetic 
uh, wave in there from traveling. And that's good, right? Because you, pre you prevent all the, uh, the noise from coming out. But what happens is uh, your, our devices run on the, uh, on the principles, principles that you need that electromagnetic <laughs> wave inside. So it's like an inductor, for example. An inductor has a little magnetic field inside. And if you put a metal, a metal shield on top of an inductor, it no longer behaves like an inductor. So basically, I'm saying if, if you take our devices or any RF device and you put a, a shield over it, and they, they usually put the shield like one millimeter away, it will affect the performance of the device. It affects the impedances of the, of the traces, and it affects the way an inductor actually even works. That, that, so, that blows me away because, again, I, I'm used to working on simulators on my computer for, say, ICs. Mm -hmm. And I know exactly how an IC is going to behave. If I give it this signal, it will do this. If you give it that signal, it will do that. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that I could have, say, three RF components. Mm -hmm. And depending on where they're placed and in what combination, they will they will act completely differently. Yes. yes. <laughs> Chief Chiebert, I know that you uh, have done some uh, some wireless work in the past. Uh, have you experienced this this phenomenon, this sort of black magic of RF? Oh, yeah. You know, we've had some problems in the past uh, in a certain unnamed desert where someone decided, oh, wow, let's go and put some cool serial numbers or, so we can track the trucks and things like that. And suddenly some of our RF started doing weird things and we found out there was metallic paint. Um, <laughs> odd things, you know, really. Some of our best antennas are actually just printed circuit boards with uh, squiggles of metal on them, you know, the traces in certain really odd patterns. And they're great antennas. Curtis, have you had any experiences with uh, wacky RF? Oh, I've had a lot of experiences with wacky RF, not just in terms <laughs> of Wi-Fi, but uh, I'm a ham radio operator, and so wacky RF is part of what I do. Um, it's interesting, though, when you talk to people, and especially when you start going up the RF spectrum, how dramatically the characteristics change. I've been watching the discussion over in um, on the chat board, people talking about the difference in characteristics between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And it really is amazing how one will penetrate walls, the other won't. won't. And learning the difference in the characteristics to go along with the RF spectrum that you're using is a critical part of making everything work. Now, uh, Saul, so let's go back to the, your example of, of the shielding. Uh, you were telling me about a, a time, and we're not going to name any names, no, no manufacturers, no products, but you had a device that had a bit of shielding, mm -hmm. and the RF wasn't behaving, and you did what to it? You, you drilled into the shielding? Yeah, yeah. We started drilling holes, and that was, that was particularly because right underneath the shield was one of our devices, and that device, as I was telling you, it needed its, its magnetic field to basically not be blocked. So we started drilling holes around our device, and and that allowed the magnetic field of uh, of our device to actually flow basically, and it 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 the performance was like like we had already tested. So once you like I said, once you put that can on top, the performance is going to degrade. Now, how did you know where to drill into the shield? Was it a <laughs> guess? Was it an educated guess, or was it a complete shot in the dark? No, no, no. Well, we we have the we have the vendors. Uh, I should say device. So we can actually, we know where our device sits and we know where we need to drill a shield. <laughs> that's, again, that, that's just, it's, it's mind boggling because, uh, again, it, it feels more like black magic than anything else. Now, uh, now continue. You, you were talking about uh, the second. The second. There's, there's another one that I, I wanted to get, leave you guys with. The, um, the RF, techniques, RF techniques haven't changed for many years. Uh, the tools are, are, are there. The tools have gotten much better. We've got, you know, 3D simulators, 3, uh, 3D electromagnetic simulators. Uh, I, we've got $100,000 software from Agilent that we, that we can simulate this in. But I've got a couple of, of, at least one slide on a Smith chart. And I don't know if you can see this. I've got a live one, too. I've got one on, one on, the, um, on the screen and then a live one here. Okay, now you got to describe what am I looking at? Because <laughs> this looks just like a circle. It looks like a black hole, basically. <laughs> Looks like a funnel. This looks like someone just went crazy in art class and, and drew something 3D-ish. I'm not really sure w what I'm looking at. This right is Smith chart. This this is actually how it, uh, RF engineers kind of manipulate around impedances. So uh, it can be normalized to any impedance, but normally we think of 
50 ohms as being the center. And if you looked at that slide that I showed you, zero ohms is over on the left and, a sh and infinity is over on the right. So you can manipulate, basically match from 50 ohms to, to any other impedance that you want. I don't know if you guys have heard of a ballon. So a ballon matches from, you know, 100 ohms to 50 ohms. So you can actually take this device and say, okay, I want to move my impedance from 100 ohms to 50 ohms. And this will tell you what you need. Like I need an inductor and a capacitor of this value. So using this device, you can actually do that. Curtis, I, I want to throw this back to you. Uh, have you ever seen this and have you ever used it for uh, your ham operations? It's one of those things. Do I know what it is? Have I seen it? Yes. But since most of what I'm doing isn't designing, especially antennas, uh, it's one of those things that I'm happy knowing how it works and glad that no one depends on me to make use of it on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, T-Bert, I mean, this, this is going actually way beyond me. When I start looking at charts like this, I, I think of the old slide rules, which I can oh, never yeah. figure out, uh, but I, I could use a calculator. What kind of tools, are, uh, what does this let me do? Well, it really lets you map where your RF energy is going and how strong is it. Uh, it's one of the, I actually use a much simplified version when I teach an antenna class. And my students and I actually built Pringles can antennas and sat there with a uh, spectrum analyzer and actually tuned the antennas for um, better performance. But a really odd um, uh, use is meteor scatter technology where I actually bounce ham signals off the plasma generated by the tiny sand sized meteors that are constantly coming into the atmosphere. Uh, we actually had a plan to bounce data from Curry Atoll way the hell on the far northern end of the Hawaiian Island chain back to Honolulu just for a really, really low bandwidth heartbeat signal so we could tell if our experiments had um, interesting things happening. And that would tell us when it was worth firing up the really expensive satellite communications. Now, Saul, I, I, I want to go back to something that you said about how the technology hasn't really changed and the tools haven't really changed except for getting a bit more advanced. Uh, let's apply that to something we would actually see in the enterprise. That's Wi-Fi. I mean, everyone uses Wi-Fi. And one of the things that I always see at conferences is you get vendors who will just continue to turn up the power on their radios, thinking that, well, if I turn the power up, everything will work better. Can you describe for me, A, what turning up the power on a radio past its designed uh, um, rate would do, and B, what does that do to just the environment, the RF environment around me? Well, amplifiers, it's, it's, very, it's very similar to audio. When you turn up your radio, you, you can hear the distortion in the speaker. You can hear the speaker start to, it, you can't, you, it, it, it'll start to degrade. Uh, RF interference is very similar. When you have an amplifier, you, you know, your phone, your access point, if you turn up the power, and the power becomes dirty. It's dirty power. <laughs> so basically that means you're spewing out energy in adjacent channels. So you're not only are you are you jamming the channel that you're in, you're probably exceeding the channel, but your your skirts outside of your band are out of out of out of the limits of the FCC. Um, so that means that they can't do it, they can't transmit in their band either. So that, that's kind of the same as, as, as you would think of in audio, right? Right. So like, for example, we're looking at the channelizer screen right now. Uh, if someone had been turning up the power on their AP, we might get something like this. This little spike here, it doesn't look like a smooth Wi-Fi curve. It looks more like a block. So it's someone using um, Wi-Fi past what the amplifier can actually do. So we, that's all dirty now. That's, it's basically made that entire RF area dead to us. And then what it does is even the, even the, the neighboring uh, energy will be higher. So there's more energy in, in the adjacent channel uh, if, it, if it gets dirty. The, the, the more you compress an amplifier, the more the skirts of the, the, the outer edges go up. So that's actually more what we're, what we're trying to prevent is from you from uh, desensing somebody else. Right, right. Well, l let's continue with that. Uh, now we know what will happen to the actual device. What happens to the environment? Uh, one of the examples you gave me earlier was when you have one device on a wireless system, you may get uh, X speed. You get two devices, and it's not X divided by two, it's X divided by three, because now you've got harmonics and interference. You get three devices, it, now, it might now be X divided by six, 
four, so on and so forth, until you get to, say, 10 devices, and suddenly it's, it's nothing. You get no throughput. Describe what's happening in the environment to make that happen. Yeah, that, that goes back to what we were talking earlier. It's like as soon as you hit the, the limit of that network's signal-to-noise, and, and if you exceed the signal-to-noise of that network, uh, then nobody, nothing gets through. So that means you can't decipher what the signal is. Um, in Wi-Fi, I'm not exactly sure what the what the signal to noise is in Wi-Fi, but like cellular networks, they have a like 8.5 dB signal to noise, and if you can't get above that that threshold, then nobody gets anything done. And I think that that's what would happen in Wi-Fi too. Is if if there was too many users, you exceeded that signal to noise, so then everybody drops off. Chibert, I know that you've uh, done a lot of antenna design. Uh, what do you do? What sort of tips do you have for increasing your signal to noise ratio? Actually, it's a black art. Um, all I really do is have a spectrum analyzer and a micrometer. So if I'm making Yagi's, the more accurate the spacing between the elements, the better my antenna tends to be. But it's a lot of trial and error. And realistically, just shaving off a millimeter or so on a um, uh, it, cathode just makes a huge, huge difference. And uh, Curtis, as a ham, you live and die by your signal-to-noise ratio. So what has it been like trying to, that maddening search for, for uh, increasing power without increasing noise? Well, it's all about figuring out which pieces of the total system you're trying to optimize. Uh, as we've heard, there are some real drawbacks to simply cranking up the power. Uh, that's something that, for example, on the uh, RF side, a lot of CB enthusiasts like to do, suddenly out there running a kilowatt, two kilowatts, and uh, spraying RF all over the place. The problem that people get into, and they really need to be aware of this, is that for most Wi-Fi users, there are some legal limits into not just how big the amplifier can be in the device, but what's called the effective radiated power, how much RF power can be emitted in a particular direction. And so there are things like the Yagi's, like the Pringles can, like you know a bunch of other different radio techniques that you can use, but it's very, very easy to use one of these much more effective antennas and find yourself on the bad side of the law. Uh, that's why if you really have to solve some enterprise problems, it pays to get an RF engineer working on it to make sure that he's solving your problem and keeping you in the good side of all of the regulatory and legal issues surrounding radio frequency energy. I don't want to beat a wireless horse to death, but uh, before we move off this topic, you were also telling me that Avago has a free tool for people who want to start taking a look at uh, noise and signal. Yes, yes. It's actually, it'll, it'll do something similar to the calculators that uh, that I showed you, the Smith Chart Calculator. Uh, you can go to www.avagotech.com slash pages slash appcat. It's, it's a free tool designed by one of the guys that actually at, at Avago to uh, help you with RF calculations. Yeah. And I'll make sure to inc include that in the show notes so you don't have to slow down, Saul, to, to get that. I'll, I'll actually put the link in. Uh, I, I do want to move into an adjoining topic, and that is... As, as someone mentioned in the chat room, I believe that was Scooter X, uh, at CES, Wi-Fi was dead to him. So he used LTE, and LTE worked relatively well. But you recently had a, a teardown where you were able to explain why it's so difficult to have voice and data on Verizon's network at the same time. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, we, we can go through the, the, the different networks as far as, uh, how Verizon, Sprint, and AT&T differ. Uh, we can start with Verizon then. Um, Verizon doesn't inherently have uh, voice and data, so they can't do simultaneous voicing data. So um, so I tore down a, a Thunderbolt, uh, HTC Thunderbolt phone, uh, slide number uh, three. It. Yeah, he's got it, he's got it. So the, the, the way that Verizon does their voice and data is by basically putting in two radios. If you notice, I labeled it Radio 1 and Radio 2. One is for voice, and one is for LTE. Uh, the issue was, I was telling you, that Verizon can't do simultaneous voice and data. So the only way they can do it, the only way they can do it was 
to put in two radios, basically two transceivers. Oh, bless you. Two transceivers, uh, two RF chains, two completely independent. It's basically like you're running two phones at the same time. And obviously you can tell the drawbacks on this is that your battery uh, will suck. So I'm sure <laughs> okay. anybody who has a Verizon phone. That's a technical phone, term. I, I understand. Yes. Anybody who has a Verizon phone will, will, or I'm sorry, this HCC Thunderbolt phone will probably have noticed that the battery life is really bad on this. Now, why is that? Why does Verizon have to have two separate radios, whereas AT&T uses one? It dates back to the, to the beginning of their networks. When AT&T started, they, they use a, a UMTS network. UMTS is kind of the way uh, Europe does it, uh, the way most of the world does it. Uh, I've heard the term GSM. Uh, GSM is, is, you can call it GSM, AT&T, but GSM has not been used for a long time. They, 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 it's the fallback. So uh, AT&T uses UMTS, and it's called WCDMA. And inherently, they built in uh, what's called packet switched networks. Uh, Verizon never did, and they never upgraded, and it was always circuit switched. So they, they, I know that's that's a very uh, network term, so that you guys understand that packet switched is basically data and circuit switch. It means a dedicated line. So there, th once you have that dedicated line in, in a voice call, you can't drop it. You can't switch over. Uh, and that's what happens when you do voice and data. You, it's just swapping back and forth. So uh, Verizon inherently couldn't do that. And the only way they got around that was keep the voice radio on all the time and then build a, uh, a second radio to do data. Oh, Curtis and Brian, uh, I, I don't want to make this a, an ageist thing, but you do remember when uh, uh, Ma Bell was making the switch over from circuit switch to packet switch, don't you? Oh, really? Uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we, we deal with enterprise networks, so we are accustomed to having everything be packet switched. Uh, so it, it, the first time Sal explained this to me, it's, it struck me as, in, as interesting that Verizon is actually running two phones inside of your phone if you are actually doing voice and data at the same time. Now, uh, so uh, continuing, yeah. you said that the reason why they don't run both networks at the same time is because of battery. Well, they do, and then the battery just drains. So, okay. so, they, so, so you like, can, but then you, you, your yeah. battery sucks. Okay. So someone, I see someone in the chat room asked about Sprint. Uh, Sprint, uh, interesting, it's, it's very similar to Verizon. They did not have... Uh, packet switch network but recently they've contract they've contracted Ericsson to basically upgrade their entire network uh, to be able to do voice and data so sprint pretty much is, is the same as at and it's not not the same as far as GSM but they still they're now they're packet switched so they can actually do voice and data right so uh, basically sprint has merged the networks and and said it's basically VoIP. Yeah. It, it's VoIP over the data connection. Yeah. Whereas Verizon still has that dedicated voice line uh, via the second radio. Yeah, and, and to finish up, T-Mobile uh, is pretty much the same as AT&T. They, they sometimes even piggyback on, on AT&T right. uh, spectrum. Uh, the, the, on Verizon, the, the future for Verizon is that they actually, right now, they, they still use two radios, but conveniently they've, they've, they've built in They've, they've built a, chi uh, Qualcomm has built a chip that has both of them inside. So there's, it's really nothing different. It just may, maybe, maybe saves you a little bit of space, so, but it's still the same idea. In the future, uh, they're going to this thing called Volte, voice over LTE. So LTE is inherently uh, all packet switched. So whenever they move over to voice over LTE, they won't have this problem. Um, the problem they will have is handoffs. What happens when you're in an LTE area and you're doing voice and data and then you move and you roam out of LTE you definitely will drop the data call and it'll it'll go to 3G but that's no problem because you can you can drop and add a call uh, data but what happens to the voice it's not clear right now what's what, what how's what's or how is that going to happen when you switch from a voice VO, voice over LTE call and then you go into a 3G network and then you go back to the old. I think what's going to happen is it's going to drop. It's going to drop your call. <laughs> it's going to drop. I don't know. Call. I don't know. There's a, a Verizon guy on on the chat. Maybe he can. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, basically what we're talking about is yeah, you can get LTE and LTE is fantastic and the data rates are are incredible. But if you are routing your call over LTE and you you move into an, a non LTE area and there are a lot of those, mm -hmm. you're going to lose your call. I think so. Okay. I, I think so. Okay. Now, uh, Brian, Curtis, I, I do want to throw this back to you because 
What does this mean for the enterprise? I mean, more and more we're, we're seeing that enterprise technology is being, it, well, it's become synonymous with wireless technology. We want wireless everywhere. So it seems like we need to know more and more about the wireless underpinnings that Saul is describing in order to do our jobs as enterprise engineers. That's true, Padre. And it, it really points to something that everyone who is managing uh, wireless deployment in enterprise IT needs to keep in mind, especially if they're allowing a BYOD, bring your own device policy. That is, you want to make sure that the devices your employees bring are able to be connected to your enterprise network in the widest variety of places. That may mean that you restrict which companies they can go with, which devices they can use, and it means ultimately staying on top of the technology both that the wireless companies are using on their own networks and in the products that they're selling to their customers, your employees. Gbert? Yeah, anyone notice that the, um, the federal government are still using Blackberries? Well, that's for a very good reason. Blackberries have paid a lot of attention to being able to secure the devices um, and BYOD doesn't mean bring your own device. It means buy your own device um, in the federal government. I want to throw the, uh, the last word over to you, to, over to you Saul. Uh, tell me how this is useful to, uh, well, just the enterprise grunt, the, the guy sitting in a data closet who is thinking about how he's going to deploy his wireless network and keep his wireless users happy. Uh, well, wireless... Wireless uh, is unregulated, so by 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 nature that there's going to be more and more wireless stuff out there at 2.4. You yeah you can move it to five and it will it will last you another few years. But at some point these these systems are 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 inherently flawed because there's no regulation as far as who can come on, you know, what what you bring onto it. Uh, unlike the cell networks that are very tightly controlled by Verizon or AT&T, right? I think that's what uh, the Wi-Fi uh, wireless LAN needs is maybe a committee to tell them that, you know, that access point can't get on or <laughs> because the, 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 the cell networks will not have that problem because Verizon will not activate your phone if you are out of spec. Right, right. And I think that maybe that's, maybe that's what needs to happen <laughs> in Wi-Fi. All right. Well, we've done it again. We've actually run out of time here on Twiat. I, I do want to uh, give my guests a chance to mention any projects they have running right now. Let's start with you, uh, Chibert. What's going on at Ankle? What's going on in Honolulu? Actually, I'm getting ready to do a proof of concept uh, with the Citrix folks to see if I can run 120 AutoCAD 3D workstations off a single server using VDI. Ought to be fun. <laughs> okay, so check out uh, uh, Ankle to find out exactly what Chibert's doing there. Curtis, what do you have going on in Florida? Well, at Enterprise Efficiency, we are actually expanding what Enterprise Efficiency does, both geographically and in topic terms. Can't get too specific, but would urge everyone to check in with us uh, in the next week or two. We've got some exciting things going on. One other shout out. I've seen several people in the chat session talk about their ham radio licenses. I'd love to see more people from the Enterprise Technology Group get involved in ham radio it's easy to do, it's valuable, and it's a heck of a lot of fun. Go out there, get your license, get on the air. And Saul, to you, what projects do you want to promote? What websites do you want to plug? Um, most of the projects that I work on, um, I really couldn't talk about, but I, <laughs> but I do, I do want to maybe promote RF engineering. I, I have, I have noticed. Uh, I've been in this industry for like twelve years, uh, and everyone seems to be getting older. So there's not as many college grads coming in. So it, it's, still, it's still a growing industry. Uh, people think that because everything's going digital, then analog is, is no longer needed. But that's completely not the case, right? Even digital communications use analog signals. So I have noticed that, you know, a lot of design centers are moving to Asia, China, Korea. So if there's new guys out there... Uh, in school, majoring in electrical engineering, and they want to get into RF, uh, it's, there's definitely plenty of job, plenty of work here. So, 
Wow, a plug for knowledge. I, I love it. I, that's That's got to be my favorite all-time plug. Now, for you out there, if you are watching this podcast uh, after the fact, after the live show, why don't you give the live show a chance? We're on at Mondays, noon, PST, at live.twit.tv. If you are watching this download later on, do us a favor and make sure you download, uh, well, the, the version that works for you. Download the audio version for your car ride. Download the high-definition goodness for you and a loved one in front of your plasma screen TV. Now also, please follow me on Twitter at PadreSJ to find out what we're going to be doing next and uh, drop by our show page at www.twit.tv forward slash twiet to find our episodes and our show notes. Also, I want to give a shout out to everyone in the chat room. You've been fantastic. You are one of the reasons why the live show works so well. And uh, to everyone out there who's watching, remember, if you want to know what's going on in the Enterprise, just keep quiet.